Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 396th episode, we have an interview with David Randall, dinosaur of the day, Draconics, and a fun fact. But before we get into that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we'd like to thank James Pascoe, DC Cassandra, the Howard family, Greg, Evelyn and Frankie, Michael, Ermel, Bradley, Michael Raptor, and Cameron. Yeah, thank you so much for being part of our dinosaur community. And without further ado, we're going to get on to our interview with David Randall. But as always, we have an extended version of this interview. So if you're a patron and you want to listen to the longer version, make sure to check out our premium content feed. We are joined this week by David Randall, who is a senior reporter at Reuters and the author of several books, including The Monster's Bones, The Discovery of T-Rex, and How It Shook Our World, which is why we're talking to him today. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So I thought it was a really great story. It's it's about T-Rex, but also about all the people that you know it affected or were affected by the T-Rex discovery, particularly, we'll get into this, but yeah, Barnum Brown. Loved reading more about Barnum mm-hmm. Brown. <laughs> I did want to just really quick, I thought it was interesting how you mentioned it was T-Rex was so popular. But it's kind of strange that for 30 years, the only place you could see a T-Rex was at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Exactly. So Barnum Brown was the first person who found a T-Rex. And he actually found uh, two more in short order. So no one else found another one for 30 years or so. Uh, So it really was this crown jewel of the American Museum of Natural History. And that's one of the reasons why it's now considered one of the best collections of dinosaur fossils in the world. Um, Much of that was Barnum Brown's doing in the first place. But that's one of those things that when I started working on this book, it's odd to think of, you know, the T-Rex has been in its place in Manhattan since before the construction of the Empire State Building. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) it is odd. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Also, the the backgrounds of people, like in the book, you mentioned there's like a line, Richard Owen was an apprentice to a local surgeon when he was young. And then that kind of got him started. <laughs> wow. That's <laughs> full on anatomy beginnings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, Mantel uh, and in England as well, the fact that he ther- theorized an iguanodon just from the tooth mm-hmm. and, you know, just the idea that you, how, you know, difference of how you masticate your food and where the smaller could be and the size of the tooth, that means the body of the animal had to be, you know, this large. It, it seems amazing that you could have all of these theorems and then ideas. And then, you know, if you look around enough, you're actually going to find a proof in the ground. Yeah. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah, it's, it's easy to look at things like the early depictions of an iguanodon and say like, oh, how ridiculous it is. You know, it's, it's totally wrong. It's not like a giant iguana and all that kind of stuff. But to think that... Another person could have found that tooth and thought, because that tooth isn't particularly big. It's not bigger than the biggest teeth we have today. So you could just think like, well, this it was just an iguana with a big head <laughs> or it was an iguana yeah. that, or a different animal that had larger teeth than we see today. But the fact that he extrapolated it out into like the same ballpark of size of an iguanodon mm-hmm. is pretty awesome. Or to even realize that it was a tooth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you're just, you know, his, his wife was literally sitting there waiting while he was working with the patient and she was only found the tooth and just to realize this was not just a rock or it wasn't you know some petrified wood or something yeah that's yeah. true it ends up going the other way a lot too where people think they found a bone and it's just a rock or wood mm-hmm. <laughs> you yeah. definitely have to have an eye for it yeah yeah the whole concept of of color i thought was so interesting too that you know in one chapter in the book barnum brown is going on one of his first professional digs and the other, he's the youngest there, and he's he's the strongest, and he has he's he's already shown this kind of innate ability to find bones, but he has to really turn his, you know, raw skill into ability and to kind of hone it, and he has to learn how to look at things, and and you know the slightest variation of color matters, especially when you're you know, in the badlands mm-hmm. and you're in a place where it seems like it's marked by the absence of color, just a very small gradation, you know, a gray versus a brown versus you know, a gray, a gray that looked kind of maroon mm-hmm. matters so much. 
And he really honed that skill in a way that nobody else had before at that time. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Mr. Bones. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was really interesting that he started off, he wanted this bigger life. Like he always knew he wanted to do something different than what he was born into. Yeah. He was the youngest of four children on a farm in Kansas. And he got his name because his older brother had gone to the, the circus. And when Barnum was born, the, his parents couldn't think of a name at first. So his you know, brother was six at the time, just bust in and yelled, let's call him Barnum. <laughs> and for some reason, his parents thought that's a great idea. And they went with it. And, you know, he he started to have that early interest in geology. His dad, you know, worked on a farm and then he he actually moved into the business of mining, of coal mining. You know, they would they'd scrape off the land of the farm um, looking for new seams of coal. And so, you know, Barnum had these huge mounds of rubble to play on as a kid. And he kept on finding seashells. And he didn't understand why. And, you know, his dad encouraged him to, to find out why, you know, in Kansas, they're six or 700 miles away from the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Why were they finding seashells under the ground? And so it was really something as small as that, that sparked what in many ways was just this incredible life. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's interesting too, because even though he ended up doing so much for the American Museum of Natural History, he grew up where all these dinosaurs or near where all these dinosaurs were that he ended up selling and working on Finding for those him. years. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was interesting too, that this idea of what was the driving force behind this age of discovery of dinosaurs. And so much of it was the same idea that, you know, mining and the extraction of natural resources became more and more important as the country went into, you know, further into the industrial age and, you know, machine age. And, you know, it's one of those things where, so much of the wealth created was from New York. The idea of let's create these giant companies, you know, Standard Oil and everything else. And that's where some of the essentially the trophies of those mining operations ended up, which were the dinosaur fossils. Hmm. Yeah. I didn't think you about know, it that. Wasn't, <laughs> the dinosaurs, dinosaurs weren't what they were looking, what many people were looking for at first. They happened to be a byproduct. And then they started to realize, wait, these dinosaurs are important as well. And you wouldn't have had people looking for dinosaurs if it wasn't for people looking for oil or silver or or iron ore or anything else. Yeah, that's really interesting. We talk, I didn't realize that that was always the case because we talk about today, especially in China where they're building a lot, they uncover tons of dinosaur fossils and they keep building new museums for them. And when we say, you know, oh, this, this fossil is a little bit damaged, but it's because, you know, when they found it, they weren't looking for dinosaur fossils. They hit it with a backhoe or something. <laughs> I didn't mm -hmm. realize that even in the very early days of dinosaur discovery in the U.S., it was the same story. They mm -hmm. were ju it just wasn't that they were building. Instead, they were trying to do some mining and found it. That's really cool. And that goes back to England as well. You know, they, a lot of the first Dinosaur bones, once they you know recognized for dinosaurs, uh, were the product of you know opening up a stone quarry or or something else that you know they're blasting into the earth and then suddenly they start to see these things that no one thought that first of all they didn't know what they were and then when they did realize that these were you know long dead animal bones they had to start realizing you know, had to start squaring this idea with what they had thought of the earth in terms of the age of the earth before. You know, it was very common until 18th, 17th, 18th century to think that the Earth was only 6,000 years old or so. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you had this evidence that the world was much, much older. And the question of, you know, how much older and what did the world look like? And then therefore, the, the Earth is so old, how important then are humans by comparison? It started opening up all these kind of existential questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. I forgot about that. Yeah, those original Iguanodon finds were also in a quarry and Archaeopteryx was mm -hmm. also in a quarry. Well, Crystal Palace dinosaurs, that was the first like deep time exhibit, mm -hmm. getting people thinking about that stuff. It seems like a lot of, I mean, we're, we're talking about the oil and mining in particular, but just the wealth in general. Wealth was an important part of paleontology in the beginning. And you've got people like Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was able mm -hmm. to basically fund like Barnum Brown and his expeditions and a bunch of other people. Exactly. And it was the search for dinosaurs became a, at the time, almost like a trophy hunting 
competition between mm-hmm. what we would think of as billionaires now, you know, JP Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, uh, Marshall Fields, all these people who, you know, were these captains of industry, they had this idea that, you know, we want to have, we're going to have museums, natural history museums that are going to show that even though there is this rampant inequality in terms of income, that there's some good purpose from from this, you know, can something good can, can come out of it, and that is a natural history museum. So therefore, if we're going to put money into this, we want to have the biggest and best dinosaur fossils to show because we want to wow people and we want to, you know, we want people coming in the doors. And that's why you had so many, you had so much money going into paleontology at the time. It, it distinguished itself from other disciplines very quickly because it had something tangible that you could show for it. It wasn't just hey, I've got this really cool theory of geology or I've got this really cool idea of plate tectonics. You know, that might be very important to other scientists and it might be very important in the scheme of, you know, how we understand the world. But that doesn't necessarily bring crowds. Mm -hmm. You know, a T-Rex brings crowds or a uh, Diplodocus brings crowds. You know, you want something big, something that, you know, stands over you. And, you know, Andrew Carnegie, when he was sending out different teams and to you know, the Wyoming and Montana wilderness, he distinctly, you know, explicitly told them to bring back big things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is one of those things about dinosaurs is people assume that they're all really big. And it is because the most famous ones in general, other than maybe Velociraptor, are really big. But I didn't realize that it basically was intentional because there are small dinosaurs in these places where they were looking. But I suppose Mm -hmm. if the people paying for the expedition say, I want the big ones, bring back the big ones, they just ignore the small bones and dig out the big ones and bring them back. They all felt a lot of pressure, the people who were digging and looking for those fossils. And then it was interesting too, just how many rivalries there were in those days because when I think of paleontology rivalries, my mind automatically goes to Marsh and Cope. But it wasn't just mm-hmm. Marsh and Cope. Like Osborne seemed to have a rivalry with a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, uh, Osborne did. And even going back to Owen and Mantle, you know, Owen was the one who coined the term dinosaur in the first place. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Mantle said that a lot of his work was essentially stolen, stolen by Owen. And then, you, you know, you go through Bone Wars, then you go to... The next, essentially everything builds on itself, like just layers of sediment, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have Osborne. And, you know, Osborne was an interesting character. He, you know, he was born with a lot of wealth, but he almost had this idea that he was predetermined to be the best. And he was incredibly arrogant. Uh, he was incredibly, he had this idea of status and he was highly focused on status. And he was, you know, that led into, he was, an unabashed eugenicist, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, outwardly racist, and he he was the driving force for the museum. And it's it's strange in some ways to think that so much of so much good from the museum in terms of how much money he poured into paleontology and to create these awe inspiring exhibits came about of from him in some ways, you know, having dark motives of wanting to prove that he's the best, that um, that there is a a racial hierarchy that extended back to before humans were born. Uh, hmm. Humans, not humans were born. Humans existed. Mm-hmm. That you know, he kind of saw all of evolution as a morality play, with white Anglo-Saxons at the top, and he saw the extinction of dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus Rex. This was before the concept of you know of a meteor causing an you know, extinction event. Mm-hmm. Um, he thought that you know many dinosaurs died out simply because of the lack of intelligence. So therefore, he, you know, the whole history of life on Earth culminated in, in white Anglo-Saxons, and he tried to have many of the museum exhibits reflect that subtly. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes not so subtly. <laughs> yeah, not so subtly too. <laughs> and that's a. Uh, it seems like so much now is undoing what Osborne did. Uh, you know, it was only a few weeks ago that they tore down a statue outside of the museum um, that was roundly criticized for its depiction of, you know, Native Americans and Black Americans. Mm. Mm. Well, that sounds like a good change. Yeah. So with with Barnum Brown, did he basically get hired by Osborne to do this work? Or how did that connection, how did he go from Kansas interested in looking at shells to 
finding T-Rex for the American Museum? So he, he graduated early from high school. There wasn't a high school in his town. So he had to go to Lawrence, Kansas for, to go to high school. And then he stayed and he went to the University of Kansas. And this was still pretty early. You know, the University of Kansas opened right after the Civil War. So he was among some of the first classes there. And, you know, being there at the sense that you were still at the beginning made it seem like a very flat place. You know, mm. the Kansas is flat anyway, but flat in terms of <laughs> you could walk into anybody's door and, yeah, hierarchy. You could walk into anybody's door and just ask a question. You didn't see it. It seemed very far removed from, you know, the, the Ivy Leagues where, you know, status mattered so much. Hmm. So he walks in to, and he basically talks his way into a, into a, into a dig, even though he had never taken any paleontology classes. <laughs> and he soon distinguishes himself that he's not only physically strong and, you know, has great reserves of energy, but he almost seems to have this innate ability to go into, you know, the field and find bones in areas where everybody else already had picked over and thought it was barren. Uh, so he continues to, to prove himself. He, in short order, finds a triceratops skull, um, and then he finds another. And he starts to kind of build this reputation as someone who just has this innate ability. His professor, he received a letter from the American Museum of Natural History asking about a different student. Um, his professor said, you know, this was, a, you must be thinking of Wilson or somebody. And, you know, he, he says, you know, he was a great student, but he was a complete failure in the field. Um, the person you really want is Barnum Brown. So they offer Brown a opportunity to, to do, you know, a dig for them. And he goes into uh, Wyoming and he very quickly finds uh, Diplodocus. And this at the time was exactly what Osborne needed. Um, Osborne had recently moved to the American Museum um, as the head of the vertebrate uh, paleontology. And he really needed a hit, essentially. You know, he's pouring his money into this and he needs something to, to make it seem like it wasn't a failure and to essentially make his dad think that he was doing something worthwhile in his life. Um, and the American Museum didn't have any dinosaur bones at the time. They had these great plans and uh, halls li laid out to pour dinosaur exhibits, but they didn't have anything to fill it yet. Hmm. So as soon as Brown finds uh, the Diplodocus, Osborne gets on a train and he heads out east because he wants to be on hand when they, um, you know, when they unearth the first dinosaur that's going to be in the American Museum's collection. Um, and this is the first time Brown and Osborne meet. And it's just the start of a partnership that would last for the remainder of their lives. And what I was struck by was that they were just so different. You know, Brown grew up on a farm in Kansas. He, you know, he literally played on mounds of dirt as a child. And Osborne seemed the complete opposite. You know, he was among the wealthiest in the country. He went to Princeton. He was ex expected to kind of join the Manhattan elite. And they were united through dinosaurs mm -hmm. and the search and the, you know, what that fulfilled for both of them. Um, Brown, he was, you know, he was a very restless person. He hated the idea of being stuck in one place. He hated the idea of being stuck, especially on a farm where so much of what you have to do is is bound by the seasons mm -hmm. um, and you don't really have any control and osborne he wanted to, to make a name for himself and he wanted to seem like he was a a big shot essentially his dad was the head of a, a railroad which was a very prominent and important business at the time and osborne wanted to see to seem like to make him feel like he was of that same level and you know kind of holding up the family prestige so there's there's this kind of strange unity between these two people who came from very different backgrounds. Yeah, we see that all the time. It's amazing how so many people are interested in dinosaurs and it it transcends all things. Age, you know, there are four year olds that know as much as 80 year olds, and there's, you know, really well educated people that you have multiple PhDs versus people that, you know, dropped out of high school and everything in between. There's just, you know, all socioeconomic statuses and religions and races and everything. There's just like, there's something about dinosaurs that is so fascinating that it doesn't matter who you are, you, you can get into it. Yeah. <laughs> That's so exactly. cool. And and it's interesting too that, you know, why do why do people like dinosaurs? I think one of the answers is that it makes you think about your life in a different way, like the kind of timelessness of it. Mm -hmm. That you kind of realize that 
these have been around for so long and they're going to be around after you're long gone. And it also just makes you kind of realize that the world around you is not always, what you see now is not always, it has not always been that way. Mm-hmm. And that lack, that sense of, you know, change, even though have change happening on a, you know, perhaps glacial scale, as opposed to, you know, a weekly or temporal scale matters a lot. And it seems like it's, it's freeing in some way to imagine that, you know, I'm, I'm looking out of our backyard in New Jersey right now that, you know, dinosaurs were here 60 million years ago where I just see rows of nice houses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. So can you tell us a little, uh, you talked a little bit about Brown finding the T-Rex specimens. He, he found three. I know for the first one, they ended up using like dynamite to open up the area. It took two years to prepare. And then it sounds like he was under pressure to find even more after that. Yeah. So this was a professor who, who studies this time called it the second Jurassic gold rush. Essentially, it was this is the era after the Bone Wars, but this is the era where you start seeing all the museums that we now are very familiar with come into being and have this competition to say, we need to fill our, our rooms as quickly as we can. So you have the Carnegie, you have what's now the Field Museum in Chicago, and you have the American Museum of Natural History. Those are the three main players. And there was just this rush of you know hundreds of people into the Dakotas, Wyoming, Colorado, all trying to find the largest and most spectacular dinosaurs that they could. Brown initially was not part of this. Um, he had gone on a hastily planned trip to Patagonia at Osborne's request. Um, so he was down there for almost two years. And when he comes back, it seems like his his status within the museum is, is much diminished, um, that he hasn't found anything lately. And, you know, he had found the Diplodocus, but that hadn't been uh, prepared fully yet. He had this constant fear that he was going to be cut loose mm. and he was going to have to go back to this Kansas farm where he, where he had nothing, he wanted nothing to do with it. So he had this drive to say, I'm gonna, I've got to find the best. I've got to find something. So he goes uh, out on his own and he goes to Montana and he ends up going to Jordan, Montana. And Jordan had the the, st- the strange distinction of being further from any railroad station than any other place in the country. <laughs> so it was really in the middle of nowhere. And he, this was 1902. And, you know, he's, he's looking for something. He sends back a box of a crate of fossils to Osborne. And he gets a letter like a week later saying that everything he sent back is ruined and worthless no. and that he should have spent more time preparing them. So he's, he, you know, he kind of feels like the clock is ticking, that if he doesn't have something soon, he's going to be in lots of trouble. So he, one day, you know, this is the middle of August, everything is broiling. He's worried that there's going to be tornadoes, that there's going to be thunderstorms. You know, the, the elements are working against him. He finds this, he goes to this mound, and he calls it Mount Sheba. Um, and he started trying to dig, and it seemed like everything he was working with was just not making any headway. He you know, found that this, this rock and this ground was incredibly hard and almost seemed impenetrable. And for some reason, he said, I'm, I'm not going to, I have to know what's under there. Maybe it was just catharsis. I just want to blow something up right now because I'm angry. But, <laughs> um, so he uses a bunch of dynamite and he blows, blows off the top of this mound and he looks down in it. And, you know, for the first time, human eyes had seen a T-Rex. There was evidence of monster down there. And he writes a letter to Osborne that night saying, I've discovered a, a, a dinosaur that was not described by Marsha Cope. And it's a carnivorous dinosaur like nothing I've ever seen before. Um, so he works against the elements and he tries to get it out as quickly as possible. And it's instantly apparent that this is something on just a completely different scale than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, It just looks more fierce. It looks like the child's conception of a monster made real. <laughs> uh, so he, he he tries to get it out as quickly as possible. He ends up doing that. He brings it back. Osborne is the one who ends up formally describing the animal and giving it its name. And I always thought it was interesting that, you know, Osborne, you can see a little bit of showmanship in Osborne because he came up with the name T-Rex. Mm-hmm. And in some ways it was him 
trying to elevate his own position, that if you are the person who has discovered or, or named, formally named the, the king of the dinosaurs, no one's ever going to take that away from you. <laughs> so, um, he, you know, he's trying to make himself seem like a big deal too. So then they, they start to work on preparing the bones. And this is just a time consuming task. I, I didn't realize like this was one of the, the many, many things I didn't realize before working on this book was how much of a, how important the job of a preparator is not just the, the field paleontologist. Oh yeah. And you just almost have this, almost like this monk like discipline to go slowly and to take your time and to not rush anything. And uh, everything you do is like instant hypothesis. And then <laughs> if you you know put too much pressure, you're going to break something. And then, something that existed for 60 million years before you came along is suddenly gone forever. And just this monster idea of, you know, putting this puzzle of life back together in a way that can make sense. And and when you're not really sure what it's supposed to look like, Mm -hmm. that's when, you know, one of those things that when they first mounted the, the T-Rex in the famous Godzilla pose, (laughs) <laughs> and no one knew at the time it was supposed to be the back was supposed to be much more horizontal at the time. Instead, its tail was dragging behind it like a wedding dress. <laughs> and so they realized that the skull is not in good enough shape. Um, so Osborne tells them that tells Brown, I, I need to go find another one. It's just such an incredible ask of somebody that, hey, you found this creature that no one's ever seen before, but it's not quite as good as I'd like it to be. So find some more. <laughs> um, so Brown goes back again. And this time, by this time, he's married to his wife, Marion, and he takes her with him. And lo and behold, they find two more. And so the American Museum soon has the only three T Rex known to exist. Wow. That is amazing. Yeah. And I guess he knew where to go, which is the big advantage. Because <laughs> that eastern Montana is the place to be if you're looking for a T-Rex. Well, at least one of the places to be. And that's the thing, too. He had to, you know, Brown was very gregarious. He just had this natural way of getting people to like him. Um, in some ways, that was a talent that, you know, how you ask the question of, you can ask the question of how did, how was one person able to find so many bones? Because hmm. at one point, over half the specimens on display on the floor of the American Museum were found by Brown. Oh, um, and part of it was that he was he just had this ability to get people to like him. He could show up in the middle of nowhere and make friends quickly. And then lo and behold, someone might say, hey, I, I saw a strange bone or I saw this strange outcrop and you want to take a look. So he wasn't only, he didn't only have to go based on, you know, this is what my guess would be. It was, you know, I'm going to go make friends and somebody's going to tell me something. Yeah. And, you know, it, it just seems like this, there's so many different ways and skills involved. And he seemed to have all of them, the, this perfect mix of what you wanted to be if you wanted to, to find things that no one ever had found. Yeah. And he was, at that point, most of the land was claimed by various people, right? So he would have had to make friends with the landowners too, I'm presuming, in order to get permission to dig. Exactly. And so the Bone Wars, a generation before, had kind of clued people in that these, that bones, you know, that dinosaurs existed, first of all, and then that their bones were valuable. So he had to, to come to agreements with landowners to say, not only can I dig here, but if I find something, how much can I buy it for a cost that's not prohibitive? Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's the modern conception of paleontology and especially finding a t-rex where money is such a big issue um the you know it was only a year or two ago there was the uh, auction of stan oh, yeah. for mm-hmm. you know 30 something million dollars and it becomes such a different issue of you know who who will be the ultimate buyer and can a mu- at the you know for something like 30 million dollars can a museum afford this you know, only today, National Geographic has a story about out that it's going to be the centerpiece of a new museum in uh, Abu Dhabi, I believe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In 2025? Yeah. So you still, you know, for some reason, a T-Rex in particular has this almost soft power, this idea that it's going to elevate a museum and it's going to increase its own status because you have this dinosaur that seems to be the one thing that everybody wants to see. Hmm. 
you know, I think it, you know, when you talk to paleontologists, they'll tell you, you know, there's so much more than a T-Rex. And they are, there is, obviously. Uh, and many of them are much more scientifically important. But there's something about a T-Rex that people are drawn to. And for that reason alone, it makes it an important species because that's what the public cares about. And then what the public cares about is ultimately what drives museums. Yeah. Yeah. And because of T-Rex, too, you mentioned in the book that Brown became one of the first celebrity scientists, basically. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, he had this life where he knew what an exposure to science or at least trying to answer scientific questions could do. It's because of his interest in science. He wasn't a farmer and he had this life where he went across the world looking, you know, be searching for the blank spots on the map and, you know, finding all these incredible creatures. And the idea was that, you know, if you allow other people to have this interest or this exposure to science, who knows where they take them? You know, you might, they might come to a museum because they've heard of a T-Rex and then develop this interest in geology or physics or astronomy or something else. But, you know, a T-Rex is a very, very big draw or a very big carrot to bring a lot of people in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brown got to work with some animators too, which was pretty cool. Like what, Willis O'Brown? Willis O'Brien? Willis O'Brien, sorry, for the Lost World. And then he consulted mm -hmm. for Disney's Fantasia. Like that's, that must have been really fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it seemed like, so the T-Rex was one of the first dinosaurs that really popped through into pop culture. You know, in the original King Kong, King Kong fights a T-Rex. In Fantasia, the T-Rex is one of the, is the centerpiece of the dinosaur segment of the movie. You know, some of the first stop most in animation movies, you know, like The Lost World, the T-Rex is always the villain. So really, you know, the whole idea of special effects and, you know, blockbuster movies really comes from the T-Rex. That was the first villain and the first, you know, everything we, we you know, the Jurassic, not only obviously the Jurassic World movies now or the Jurassic Park movies, but every other special effects laden movie really can trace its back its roots back to the introduction of T-Rex in the culture. Yeah. And that makes sense then why the, the title of your book is The Monster's Bone, The Discovery of T-Rex and How It Shook Our World. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was, you know, it, it's, it's weird that it took on a life of its own in a way that other artifacts of science don't or haven't, mm -hmm. you know, that you know, it's not, a, you know, in comic books, you know, Batman had a T-Rex in the Batcave, you know, Wonder Woman fought one, a mechanical T-Rex for, for Batman, obviously. But <laughs> um, it was, you know, it, and it's so iconic now that if you, you know, you see four or five year olds, most likely if you stand at a preschool, you're going to see somebody with a T-Rex shirt on pretty quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just struck by the, there are very other few, th there's few things that you're going to find in the Natural History Museum that you're also going to see on a, on a T-shirt or in a comic book or in a movie. Um, and T-Rex is one of them. For, and for that reason, for many people, it's the gateway to science, it's the gateway to the idea that the concept of deep time and, and you know, this idea that the climate can change too. Yeah, definitely. I just had to check. I am wearing a, a T-Rex shirt by coincidence right now. <laughs> from a natural history museum. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's from the Museum of the Rockies and they have the map of Montana and inside it they put a T-Rex because, of course, if they're going to pick a dinosaur to represent their museum, it's got to be T-Rex. <laughs> it's a little unfair. Garrett only wears dinosaur shirts, yeah. though, so there was a good chance. T-Rex is probably only yeah, one out of like every four. <laughs> it is probably the most popular dinosaur on the shirts, though. There was that, you know, it was only a couple, was it like a month or two ago, The Rock was on ESPN and, or on ABC or some show, mm -hmm. and he had a cast of Stan's skull behind yes. him. And that itself was a, a new story. You know, the yeah. T-Rex, for something that's lost of them walked 65 million years ago, it's surprisingly alive in our culture. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, I, I liked your description of it as basically a real life version of a child's nightmares, you yeah. know, the huge teeth, mm -hmm. the big head, everything about it is what you would basically do other than the arms. Everything about it is yeah. what you would imagine a big monster being. And the fact that people were afraid of creatures like this, and then eventually someone found one really mm -hmm. is, you can see why people are so fascinated by it. And at the time too, 
because there wasn't the idea of the extinction event and the the idea was that you know we don't know why dinosaurs went extinct but we think you know brains had something to do with it it was a weird concept that like it was a scary thing that made you feel better about yourself mm-hmm. you know that the world used to be scarier but now it's we're you know more quote unquote civilized and we have more intelligence and we don't have to deal with these scary things from the past yeah that's a good point mhm definitely so for our listeners, uh, where would the best place be if they wanted to find out more about you and your work, probably online? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter. It's DK Randall, R-A-N-D-A-L-L. And uh, you can also get the book pretty much anywhere you find books. And I have a website too, davidkentrandall.com. Awesome. We'll have a link to all of those in our show notes. And again, the book is called The Monster's Bones. And it's out now. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks again, David, for the great interview. I have a new admiration for Barnum Brown now, thanks to your book. Oh, yes, me too. And now we're going to go on to a quick sponsor break. But when we get back, we'll have Dinosaur of the Day, Dre Comics. And now on to our Dinosaur of the Day, Dre Comics, which was a request from Crovia, our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Draconics was an ornithopod that lived in the late Jurassic in what is now Portugal in the Lorenha Formation. It looked kind of like Iguanodon. It had the bulky body and short arms and a long tail. It was relatively small, though, compared to its relatives, and it was bipedal and possibly a fast runner. It's estimated to be between 9.8 to 13.1 feet, or 3 and 4 meters. That is quite a bit smaller than Iguanodon. Yes. And, of course, it was an herbivore. It had leaf-shaped denticles, the serrations on the teeth. It also had long, claw-like ungules on its hands, but it didn't have that spike thumb. Hmm. Sort of the defining characteristic. <laughs> kind of, yeah. It had gracile feet, and its first toe was shorter and less robust than its other toes. The type species is Draconix loreori. It was found in 1991 and housed in the collections of the Museo de Lorenjoa and described in 2001 by Octavio Mateus and Miguel Teles Antunes. The genus name means dragon claw and it refers to the claw material that was found. The species name is in honor of Juel J. Loreo, a priest and pioneer in paleontology in Portugal. Is a priest and a pioneer in paleontology? Yeah. Sounds like Velocipaster. <laughs> <laughs> But better, because that's not hard to beat. <laughs> that was a pretty bad movie. This is what I think of when I think priest meets dinosaur. <laughs> no, think of people who discovered dinosaurs. It's better. It is better. <laughs> now, Filippo Rotatori and others reevaluated Draconics in 2022, this year, and they described unreported forelimb material of the holotype and re-described the holotype. They CT scan the fossils. Carlos Anunciatzao, who discovered the dinosaur, had additional holotype material in his collection at home and recently donated it to the museum. Nice. Yeah. Draconix was thought to be a camptosaurid, but now it's considered to be a Styracosternin iguanodontian. And others in that group include Camptosaurus, Iguanodon, and Mentelosaurus, all of which were much larger than Draconix. The holotype of Draconix includes a partial skeleton, but no skull. It does include two teeth, a chevron, part of the humerus, astragalus, or the ankle bone, metatarsals, or the foot bones, the forelimb, and more. And that holotype, based on histology, that specimen was about 30 years old. It's considered to be one of the senile individuals. Oh, back to that weird designation yeah. again. Just means it was older and fully grown for a while. <laughs> there was a left femur later referred to Draconix, but then that ended up being referred to Ankylopolexia indeterminate. Now, based on histology from a 2017 study, the holotype specimen was he said about 30 years old, but it's somewhere between 27 and 31 years old. So in the same sort of age range as some of the older T-Rex individuals. Oh, yeah. Hadn't thought about that. But not as old as some of the other large theropods. Yeah. Still pretty on the older side for dinosaurs, though. Yes. 
It's also one of the oldest species of Styracosterna, meaning it was just around earlier. And that may mean that Styracosterna originated in Europe. It's possible that basal Styracosternans were bipedal and fast runners, and then later they became bigger and walked on four legs. It does seem to be the typical way for dinosaurs, starting out quick and bipedal and then getting bigger and bigger and heavier, and sometimes quadrupedal. And taking over, yeah. <laughs> Now, other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Draconics include the Carcharodontosaur Lusovenador and the Ankylosaur Dracopelta. And for our fun fact, I'm doing the fun fact in this episode, we talked a little bit in our interview about how Barnum Brown was named after Phineas Taylor or P.T. Barnum, that showman, the businessman, the politician, author, and philanthropist. He was known for founding the Barnum and Bailey Circus. And it seems that Barnum Brown's family was really excited about the traveling circus and hoped that Barnum Brown would do extraordinary things. Like run off and join the circus? <laughs> he did run off and it wasn't joining the circus, but he got some big stuff on display. That's true. Yeah. In a way, that's sort of like a P.T. Barnum move. Like, look at this extravagant thing never seen before by man. Yeah. It's <laughs> showmanship. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, Barnum Brown's Probably best known for finding the first T-Rex fossils, so that wasn't the only big thing that he found, but it is one of the most well-known things. Barnum Brown's also known by another name, we briefly mentioned this in the interview, because he was so good at finding fossils, sometimes people called him Mr. Bones. That's a fun nickname. That is, yeah. I was looking into other nicknames for people in paleontology. Mainly Henry Osborne, since he's the other kind of main person in the book that we talked about with David Randall. I couldn't find any nicknames for him. But as we mentioned in our interview, Osborne did fund a lot of digs for many famous fossil hunters. And in addition to Barnum Brown, he worked with Charles Sternberg and Roy Chapman Andrews. Osborne also named a lot of dinosaurs. Well, he named a lot of animals in general, but we'll stick to the dinosaurs <laughs> in this show. In addition to naming Tyrannosaurus rex, the tyrant king, he also named the dinosaurs Velociraptor, Ornitholestes, Struthiomimus, and Ovaraptor, some of the most well-known dinosaurs. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. If you'd like the complete show notes, including links to this week's interview, then be sure to check out the page on inodino.com. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.